You're listening to Physician Non-Clinical Careers, episode number 331. Why build your own rewarding CME and CE writing business? Today, I'm interviewing an expert on CME and CE medical writing. She's a former trauma operating room nurse, and she pursued her PhD and worked as faculty at the universities of Aberdeen and Edinburgh in Scotland for a decade. She left academia in 2004 and subsequently built a thriving freelance medical writing business in the USA that specializes in creating content for continuing education in the health professions. Okay, we call that CME or CE, continuing education or continuing medical education. However, before we do that, let's hear from our sponsor. Our long-standing show sponsor, the University of Tennessee Executive MBA Program. The UT Pemba is the longest-running, most highly respected physician-only executive MBA in the country, and it's produced more than 700 graduates. The Haslam College of Business was recently ranked number one in the world by Economist Magazine as the most relevant executive MBA program, and it's a program that only takes two years to complete. And you'll also complete a company project while you're in the program so you can really demonstrate the skills you're learning to your colleagues and maybe to your boss. Graduates have taken leadership positions at major healthcare organizations and have become entrepreneurs and business owners. So if you want to acquire new business and management skills and advance your non-clinical career, then contact Dr. Kate Ashley's office at 865 974 6526, or use our handy link at nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash physician MBA. By the way, did you know that you too can sponsor the Physician Non-Clinical Careers podcast? As a sponsor, you'll reach thousands of physicians with each episode to sell your products and services or to build your following. Your message will be heard on the podcast and seen on our website, in our newsletter, and in social media posts. Remember, this podcast and my emails and social media posts all reach clinicians with a preponderance of physicians. So you can learn more about that by going to john.jerica.md at gmail.com. You know, send us an email at john.jerica.md at gmail.com. Include the word sponsor in the subject line. And at that point, I'll either send you to our landing page or I'll just send you some more information directly about becoming a sponsor. All right, let's get to today's episode, our interview with Dr. Alexandra Hausen, who's a medical writer, educator, and podcaster. Alex now teaches and coaches new to the field medical writers how to break into CME, find clients, and build a sustainable CME slash CE writing niche. Today, we'll find out more about developing a medical writing career that focuses exclusively on continuing education for healthcare professionals. All right, here we go. Um, I've spent a lot of time promoting continuing education over the years. Uh, In fact, I did uh, probably over 100 surveys for the ACCME and I just think it's always been something that I wanted to promote for my colleagues and when I was working in the hospital setting and so forth. So, so that's one reason why I'm really anxious to talk to today's guest. The other is I love medical writing. I've had some other guests that talked about medical writing in the past. And um, when I recently discovered today's guest as being a CME and CE writer who also trains people to be medical writers specifically in these areas, I just knew I had to have her here today. So uh, I think you'll really appreciate today's interview. So hello and welcome, Dr. Alexandra Hausen. I'm glad to have you here. I'm really happy to be here, John. Thank you for inviting me. And I didn't mention, but it'll come up later, but the fact that you're another podcaster, of course, also means that we have this kind of connection. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I really want to pick your brain a lot because I you know, what I do is try to really find opportunities for listeners to pursue certain non-clinical, non-traditional careers. And this is one excellent one. Uh, So it's going to be fun. All right. To start off, I need you to give us a little bit about your background, education, clinical career, and maybe even like why you left clinical activities. 
Oh yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I trained as a nurse about a hundred years ago in Scotland um, and worked as a trauma OR nurse in a regional trauma center for, for several years. And, um, the, you know, as your listeners will know, um, you know, trauma is fast paced. Um, it's pretty challenging. The turnaround times can be excruciating. And, um, you know, at some point I started toying with the idea of, of moving out of healthcare because I wasn't burned out. I, you know, that's a very particular term, but I definitely felt, um, frazzled Mm -hmm. and wasn't really sure what my kind of long-term future in healthcare, you know, was going to look like. I really wanted the opportunity to do a deeper dive into, you know, medicine, health and healing. Um, I trained as a nurse at a time in Scotland in the 1980s, just before university programs for nurses Mm. um, were launched. So I was still in the kind of college, uh, hospital college system. So I didn't have a degree and I really wanted the opportunity to do some academic work. And so, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to go to the University of Edinburgh to do an undergraduate degree uh, in the late 80s. Um, I loved learning and writing and doing research and so kind of stayed in academia for another you know 10 to 15 years hunkered Mm -hmm. down did a master's and a phd and uh, you know ended up teaching and doing research at uh, university of edinburgh and university of aberdeen but i've stayed very much in the world of healthcare Mm-hmm. Um, you know, teaching courses on sociology of health and illness, medical sociology, doing research on public health and women's health, and teaching uh, medical students, um, you know, uh, in in the context of uh, health communication and public health courses that they they did at the University of Edinburgh, University of Aberdeen. Okay. So yeah, you that was definitely a, a, a right turn into academics. So that was a big undertaking. Um, but then it set you up really well for being a writer and for teaching writing and that kind of thing. Um, so so when did you really get into that aspect? You know, once you had become an academician, you were working at the university. Um, yeah, just tell us more about that transition. Yeah, so more of of a push than a pull in a sense. So as an academic and as a nurse, actually, I had been writing a little bit. um, And as an academic, of course, you're you're writing, you're publishing. Um, I'd written books and research papers and that kind of thing. Um, But my family moved from Scotland to the US in 2004, just toward the end of 2004. And um, I you know, I looked for an academic job (laughs) and I couldn't get one. So that was the push part. Um, And I think in retrospect, and I think this might have a bearing on some of the things that your audience experience. um, I think there were two things. One is I didn't really have an academic network in the US. Mm. I was at Berkeley for a year as a research scholar, but I didn't really build my network when we moved to the States. The second Mm -hmm. thing is my heart wasn't in it. Um, you know, academia in the UK in the um, 90s got very um, research funding focused. And I wasn't really sure that I, I wanted to be in that mix. And I didn't really know what academia in the US looked like. So I think there were kind of two things there that um, meant my search was half, half-hearted, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to say the yeah. least. Things really shifted for me when I stopped looking for work for jobs and started looking for work you Mm. know I took a big step back in 2005 2006 and started to look at what my skill set was and um, really that centered around a kind of trifecta of research writing and teaching and so I started to look for work that would allow me to do those things Mm -hmm. and in that process found the american medical writers association which is a fantastic resource for anybody who's thinking about moving out of clinical practice into uh, the medical writing world which is a very vast world i discovered that pretty quickly um you know there's regulatory there's um there's marketing copy there's consumer health patient education 
And um, I found continuing medical education. I did a workshop at an annual conference, probably around 2007. And uh, knew at that point I'd found my sweet spot because uh, CME and continuing education for health professionals is, you know, requires research, Mm -hmm. writing. And um, as a writer, if I'm not doing the teaching, at least I have to understand what um, adult learning uh looks like and and how to write in a way that promotes adult learning yeah and you know we all need to be continuing our education but on top of that we all are required to continue our education so there's a big demand there ongoing there is there absolutely there absolutely is and that's what that's actually one of the things that makes cme such um an attractive proposition for clinicians who are looking to move into medical writing because, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry apart from anything else. It's not going away anytime soon because of that mandatory requirement. And, you know, there are some kind of interesting and creative things going on in accredited CME that um, aren't really permitted, permitted on the promotional side of education. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, it's kind of an interesting field in that respect. So now as someone who helps others become writers of CME and CE, um, stepping back from your own, you know, reasons for getting into it, what are kind of the pros and cons of if someone's considering this? Because there there are certain requirements you have to meet, but I think it maybe meets, uh, needs a certain type of personality. I don't know. What are your thoughts on the kind of the pros and cons of pursuing this type of career? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. I think CME is a really good place for people who see themselves as lifelong learners, as information synthesizers, and as problem solvers, um, because you're doing all of those things um, all of the time in, in CME as a writer. Um, you do, of course, have to be able to uh, write and have the kind of basics of, of writing down. If you are somebody who enjoys writing, um, but haven't had a lot of opportunity to do that in clinical practice. The American Medical Writers Association has some great workshops where you can kind of polish your skills and um, even get certification, um, uh, you know, uh, um, for basic skills like grammar and punctuation and those kinds of things. And those are those are things that we can forget when we're not mm-hmm. writing consistently so mm. uh it's 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 def- definitely something to consider so writing is kind of a foundational um skill i think um having an understanding of adult learning and um which of course is a clinician because of mandatory cme y- y- you know the drill now i think that if you're a clinician you probably also have participated in some pretty bad <laughs> mm-hmm. uh you know education uh, activities but that all kind of feeds into the mix in the sense of you know what's worked for you as a clinician and w- what has allowed you to um you know kind of put something into practice in your own clinical uh setting so i think that's something to kind of carry with you into the continuing medical education world if you're if you're thinking about that as as a possibility um being able to research to do the research and synthesize that uh, information pretty quickly is a key skill. Mm-hmm. CME is fast paced and it's only getting uh, faster because there's been a lot of private equity uh, acquisition of continuing medical education companies um, with a different set, a different value set there in terms of turnaround times and that kind of thing. So if you're a writer, you have to work pretty quickly in terms of finding out what the key uh, data and uh, research publications are, pulling that information together quickly and also offering some synthesis and insight um, into what the kind of key findings are and presenting that in a way for learners that is accessible and, you know, interesting and and has applicability. A couple of things, I guess I would comment on. We, you know, physicians and uh, PhDs for that matter, doctors of all sorts, you know, like yourself. I mean, we've learned, you know, to sort of budget our time and keep our promises. But I, 
I feel like the medical writer is in many cases, like has to be extremely um, self-disciplined. <laughs> you know, there's a schedule, things are due, there are deadlines. Mm -hmm. And if you're working freelance, which I need to ask you that question too, are, yeah. are most people freelance or most working for someone directly? So you can maybe address both of those observations and questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in so can, CME is is actually one of the areas in medical writing, you know, sort of under the medical writing umbrella in general, where there's a high um, rate of freelance work mm -hmm. in comparison to something like regulatory, for instance, where mm -hmm. you know that's very employment based. Um, so that's an a, that's certainly a, you know a pro if you are interested in the flexibility and freedom that can come with freelance work. You know, you, you mm -hmm. have to work at that, uh, it, you know, in order to establish that flexibility for yourself. Um, and I would say that in order to ensure that flexibility and freedom, you know, the flip side of that is discipline, as you suggest. You you do have to kind of um, think about how you're going to build your business as a freelance medical writer, uh, whether it's in CME or, or not. Um, and I think you know, this is certainly one of the areas for me um, where I experienced a kind of light bulb moment. I stopped thinking of myself as a freelancer and started thinking of myself as a freelance business owner. And then you start mm. to get really serious mm -hmm. about how you are going to build and sustain that business because you have to think about um, not only income, but revenue. Uh, you know this, I'm, I'm sure, very well. Uh, you know, you have to think about the bigger picture in terms of what you're bringing into the business, what you need to sustain the business, what you're going to pay yourself, how much you're going to use of your revenue to market and what kind of marketing you're going to, to do and what kind of long-term vision you have for the business you're building. So there's a lot of things to think about for sure. You can also not enter into that sort of business mindset and stay you know, a little bit looser, you know, in that sort of freelance uh, mindset. But I do think I do know that things changed for me when I, I shifted uh, into a kind of more business ownership, you know, type of, of, of mindset. So discipline is a huge part of of not only building your business, but also um, keeping your promises. I like that phrase to your clients because you're going to be juggling you know, more than one client at a time. Mm -hmm. And so that scheduling can fall apart like a deck of cards. Um, you have to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of all your different projects, when those timelines are due, the different tasks associated with those projects and the order you're going to do them in and, and, and those sorts of things. Now, one of the things that's come up when I've spoken with other medical writers doing other things, let's say other than the technical, as you mentioned, is that you know, at the beginning, it seemed overwhelming. You know, it's like you're looking for these people to work for as a freelancer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe doing journalistic or things, you know, aimed at the public, which is different from CME, which again, has those demands that you mentioned. But what I have heard is that they find out, no, once you have an in and you have relationships with two, three, four, you know, it's recurring usually if you're doing a good job. And is that similar in the CME world? Repeat business is definitely the, the way to go. So I think the first point that you mentioned there around relationships is key. CME is a very small world. It's it's pretty subterranean. It can be hard to find. I think it's a little different for physicians because obviously, you know, um, they have experience of doing uh, CME, but it can still be tricky to find out who are the key players in the CME world. Fortunately, um, ACCME, the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, kind of makes that easy for us because it produces a quarterly list of every accredited provider. Well, you've done a lot of survey work for ACCME, so you know this. Uh, every accredited provider in North America, actually, and some in Europe uh, as well. The European scene is very different. It's changing. It's always in flux. Um, and so you can actually use that list as a starting point to think about a few things. First of all, the category of medical education provider you might be interested in working with. So that could be medical societies like the American College of Cardiology, 
or it could be medical education companies. Mm -hmm. Medscape is a medical education company. Um, and there are several other categories of um, providers. That list also has the contact details for key people who are responsible for CME in, in those organizations. The list itself isn't kind of categorized. I actually <laughs> have a categorized list that I share with my uh, membership, but it's a good place to start. And there are some other places where you can find that information as well. Um, and to go back to your point about relationship building, you can use that as a way to um, take baby steps toward building relationships using LinkedIn. I know that you've talked about LinkedIn before on your podcast many, many times. It's a great resource for physicians thinking about this type of career move because not only do medical writers hang out, hang out on LinkedIn as their main social media platform, but also um, education providers as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's a CME group on LinkedIn, which has about 13,000 members. So, you know, there are a lot of resources there to tap. Building relationships is a long game um, and it can often take, you know, six months to two years from that first contact point to securing a contract. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely a, a valuable uh, kind of marketplace to, to uh, participate in and be visible in and, I, you know, I think most importantly, engage with other people in the field. Well, the nice thing about medical writing is that you can start doing it while you're still working clinically or whatever you might have been doing before deciding to pursue this. So that's good. And you do can. some of the things you've already mentioned. Uh, any other things like for the fledgling writer, uh, especially in CME or CE? you know, of other steps they can take. So you've talked about networking, you've talked about, you know, the accessing the ACCME's list, any other thoughts? Well, I think, you know, one of the key things I mentioned earlier that uh, it's a bit of a subterranean world. I think one of the key things is really to try and kind of familiarize yourself with, with the landscape. Obviously physicians have an advantage. They know what CME is and why it's important, but getting a sense of who the kind of key players are um, and what some of the key challenges and uh, ongoing debates in the field are can also be helpful. The Alliance for Continuing Education in the Health Professionals in the health professions is mm -hmm. the key organization to consider joining and participating in to get that sense of what the field looks like. It, you know, it's in comparison to some other memberships, um, it, it's it's. The price point can be a little high, but they've just introduced a new um, kind of new to the field type of membership. Um, so I, I would recommend taking advantage of that and uh, kind of getting involved with that organization. That's certainly one thing to do. I think uh, so familiarizing yourself with the field. The other thing is uh, there are ways to kind of apprise yourself of key adult learning principles. Um, so that at least you have a kind of working knowledge of uh, what, uh, you know, the kind of basic foundation for, for CME, you know, adults like to learn at their own pace. Um, they, they need access to information and education that is meaningful to their immediate clinical context. They want to be able to put things into practice right away. These, these kinds of things. I think the other thing to be, to think about is that writing isn't the only potential role for physicians as a non-clinical career um, in, in CME. You know, you could think about uh, being a clinical director, scientific director, medical director, so that you're, you might do some writing as part of that role, but also be managing other writers to help mm. create needs assessments, um, content for education activities and outcomes reports, which is the kind of the, the, the end result of all this uh, education that we that we participate participate in and contribute to. And there are other roles like education strategy, business development, if you're interested in sales. Um, hmm. So there are a number of different things that that physicians can do in CME. One of the things I wanted to mention too, uh, before I forget, is that for those who are listening or watching that aren't physicians, uh, there are many non-physicians that write CME. So don't, you know, even directed at physicians, 
uh, for their requirements. I mean, I do some editing and I think half of the writers of the material I'm editing for physicians are written by non-physicians, you know, just like someone like you, master's, PhD, nurse, APN, P, you know, PA, they just have the expertise and they have that mindset. Absolutely. And I think one of the things we've seen over the last few years is a growth in the, um, the movement of academics, researchers, nurses, pharmacists, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, radiographers, radiologists, uh, you know, a whole bunch of vets as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, veteran, veteran. I think I saw that on your podcast. I can't say that word. Yes. Did you interview a vet? Yeah, this morning, actually, we just released, um, <laughs> A podcast with a, a vet. So there are a lot of different uh, types of clinicians who are moving into CME or, or trying to move into CME because they see it as a nourishing type of field to be working in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, we did mention that podcast. So I want to hear more about the podcast. Why don't we segue to that now and tell me, you know, how you started there, why you started the podcast and what is the content that you're covering for the most part, obviously probably about writing CME. (laughs) Yeah. So like a lot of podcasts, uh, the podcast has uh, evolved a little bit. We're, we're just coming to the end of our third year. Mm -hmm. Um, I started the podcast in 2020, mainly as a way to actually keep in contact with my peers and colleagues um, in CME. And that has evolved into a couple of things. One is, you know, celebrating and elevating the work of the people who create education that supports health profession professionals. And the second thing is to really use the podcast to explore best practices in creating that mm-hmm. content. So, you know, we focus on adult learning, we focus on formats, we focus on healthcare trends that influence the type of content that we create. Um, uh, you know, and a, a number of other things as well. And I guess the third thing, there's three things, everything, every good thing comes in threes is to use the podcast as a place to share resources and support for people who are working in this field, because um, it's, because it's fast paced, it's easy to, um, it, it's, it's, it's actually quite challenging to have access to practical uh, resources to help you kind of do your daily work. Yeah. And it's called right medicine. Is that it's correct? called right medicine. W R I T E, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so. And we do talk about writing as well. So we talk th- about things like storytelling, what that means in a, in a clinical education context. Uh, we had Jay Baruch, who's an ER physician uh, in uh, Rhode Island. I think he published a book called tornado of life earlier this year. So uh, that episode really kind of focused on, uh, you know, patient stories and the significance of patient stories for clinical care and, uh, Mm. you know, your own practice as a clinician, Mm -hmm. Um, but also using writing as a way to work through uh, your, your own clinical practice challenges. Um, So we talk about storytelling on the, on the podcast, as well as other things that uh, contribute to creating content. Very good. And I was going to thank you before a minute ago when you mentioned the Alliance, because I've had many medical writers. I've never actually had anyone mention we've never discussed the Alliance before. And so I'm glad you brought that up because that is an awesome resource. It is. Absolutely. Now, another great resource is you, (laughs) because (laughs) I know that you have some courses on your website, um, I think it's alexhausen.com is your overall Correct. website for what you do. But I mean, there's some really pretty interesting resources there. And I think, you know, this is one of the reasons why I started the podcast too, is because we're all, we're looking for these resources. They didn't exist. And, you know, over time mm-hmm. I've been able to make these connections with people like you that are creating things that if only more people knew about them. So tell us a little bit more about those things. That you do uh sh- sure absolutely and first of all yeah i think you're right i think that we are we are moving into uh, i know that we've been talking about the creator economy for you know a couple of years now but we're moving into an educator creator economy mm-hmm. um where people are not getting access to the kind of uh, support and information that they need to to do their their work uh so i i think that's an interesting shift um yeah so I have a free uh, guide, uh, Write CME Roadmap, which um, provides kind of information for people who are thinking about moving into CME. 
Um, it's a, an ebook with a private podcast attached to it. So you can nice. listen on the go. Yeah, no, it, you can listen on the go. You don't have to um, be tied to your laptop to, to, or your computer to read an ebook. Um, and that the guide really kind of takes you through some of the things that we've talked about uh, today. And it's a, it's a, it's the first stepping stone if you're really not that familiar with CME. Um, the podcast itself, of course, I think is mm -hmm. a, I see it as a resource. Um, I write a blog. Um, so there are a lot of blog articles, a lot of articles on my blog around how to start thinking about building a portfolio. What are some of the kind of key things that you need to be thinking about in terms of identifying your own skills if you're thinking of moving into CME? Um, so there are a lot of resources in the blog as well. And uh, I run um, uh, coaching programs and a professional development membership, Write CME Pro, for people who are looking to grow, you know, build and grow their business into a sort of sustainable business in CME. Okay, I was curious about that. So the Write CME Pro... So that has more uh, looking at the business aspects of it, the marketing or the even the formation, like forming an LLC or not forming an LLC, those kind of conversations. Yeah, so um, actually we'll be doing more of that uh, going into 2024 with the current cohort. But Right CME Pro does a number of things. First of all, uh, we pull in experts from the CME world, um, you know, every couple of months or so to talk about things like accreditation. Um, which, you know, as a writer, you don't necessarily need to know all the ins and outs, but you do need to understand the significance of accreditation in the CME world. One of the things that I find, maybe you find this too, is that people get, people can get very confused between, uh, accredited continuing education and promotional education and kind of mm. conflate the few. And it's important to separate those. So we have mm. experts who come into the membership and um, share their perspectives on a whole bunch of different uh, things, including marketing and um, things to think about when you're building your business. We've just completed a series on that with um, uh, uh, Laura DeMilto and Genevieve Walker, who are experts in in these fields and also our colleagues uh, who teach um, along with me on the University of Chicago Medical Writing Professional Certificate Program. Mm. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Tell me about that certificate because you know people ask me all the time, well, sure. is there something I can do? Like, should I take get a master's degree in writing or something? Or should I you know, get a certificate from some organization? That, that kind of sounds a little bit like something like that. Yeah, so the certificate program, it's its the Medical Writing and Editing Certificate Program at the University of Chicago. It's part of their, it, it used to be part of the Graham School. It's part of their, um, you know, business and professional development portfolio. Um, there are um, kind of core and elective modules in that program, uh, things like regulatory writing, clinical trials, publications. Uh, I teach ethics, medical writing and editing ethics. Um, marketing and uh, building a freelance business. There's a couple of other other program uh, modules on the program as well, and um, we do find a lot of uh, health professionals are taking this program precisely for that reason. They are looking for a way um, to kind of solidify and credentialize um, that shift from clinical practice into into medical writing. Okay, now I have to apologize for that digression because I still had questions about Write CME Pro. That sounds oh, yeah, you know, okay. very interesting with other experts and yourself involved. Is this something that's live, ongoing? Uh, is it like group coaching? Is it recorded? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> every month, yeah. So every quarter we'll have um, an expert perspective, um, a group coaching. Every month we have group coaching. So we'll focus on practical things um, and do sprints. So for instance, this year we've done sprints on writing outcomes reports, um, developing patient cases, 
um, and uh, uh, writing test questions, which is an area of uh, premium skill that is very challenging to learn. So we bring in experts for that. So yeah, we have group coaching. Everything is, uh, we have replays, obviously, for people who can't make live sessions. We do the coaching live online. I'm actually shifting that to a private podcast. I'm all about private podcasts in 2024 because we're all busy and being able to listen and learn on the move, um, you know, can be can be really helpful. Um, and there are a lot of resources that we build up in Write CME Pro that are exclusive to to members. So yeah, it's ongoing. It's um, in twenty twenty four. We'll be focusing a little more on things like. Um, uh, you know, building, building your business. So once you get going and you have a few clients, what do you need to start thinking about in terms of systems and in terms of uh, a tech stack um, and, and those sorts of things. Okay. That helps a lot because you, you don't have like one cohort that goes together for six months or a year. It sounds like it's a, it's set up as a membership. People can just keep coming and they can drop off of course, but as long as they're getting value, they just keep coming back and participating and you keep adding and, and growing the, the content. It is an ongoing uh, professional development membership. We will be starting um, a cohort based coaching program in mm. the spring called CME Preneur. Okay. which is, yeah, so it'll be, a, you know, a shorter program to get people sort of un, up and running um, so that they have all the tools in place they need to uh, break into CME and build their business. All right. So again, where do we go to find all that? That's all under your website, right? All the information that we've been talking about today is um, on alexhausen.com, the podcast, the blog. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn. I, I love to have conversations with people. I spend uh, quite a bit of time on LinkedIn every day. So uh, I'd love it if you could connect with me there. And uh, yeah, that's the main place. All right. Well, that has been a very useful and uh, exciting to me, you know, to hear everything because I didn't even know about you, you know, six months ago. So now here I am. I got a podcast to listen to and all this stuff to learn about and share with my listeners. So this has been really fun. You know, we're a little over our time, but uh, any last words of encouragement for people out there, physicians and non-physicians, you know, other clinicians who are thinking, eh, maybe I need to do something besides clinical in terms of looking at uh, writing educational educationally? Yes, you have what you need to move into CME. One of the things I see again and again is, you know, heavy duty, smart people coming from uh, clinical settings and healthcare and moving out of that professional context into medical writing and almost instant, instantly losing a sense of identity and competence. Mm. But you have those things. Uh, make connections, network with your peers, uh, join some kind of uh, group, know that you already have the skills that you need in order to be a successful writer in the continuing medical education world. Well, thanks for those, you know, inspiring words. And uh, I really appreciate you for being here today, Alex. It's been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. So thanks a lot for uh, being a, a guest on the podcast. I've really enjoyed it, John. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I appreciate You're it. welcome. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Being licensed as a clinician brings with it a lot of regulations and certifications, and much of that regulation spills over into the area of continuing education. In other words, you have to get CE and CME to continue to maintain your license. We know that all licensed healthcare workers need CME and CE to maintain those licenses, as I said. And that means there's an ever-increasing demand for expert writers to create those educational offerings, most of which should provide much-needed educational credits so that they can maintain their licenses. That requires that you understand how to create content that CME and CE credit uh, is available for and the application of adult learning principles, which is not really a separate topic because this the reason that you need to apply for credit for a lot of the CME or CE is to ensure that you are using 
adult learning principles, and also that you're providing actual content that will support those licenses. All right. So Alex can be a valuable resource if you choose to pursue a medical writing career that involves continuing education. You can find her on LinkedIn by looking up Alexandra Hausen. It's pretty simple. Last name H-O-W-S-E-N. And her website's alexhausen.com, A-L-E-X-H-O-W-S-E-N.com. And there you'll find a link to a bunch of resources as well as her free Right CME roadmap that we discussed during our conversation. Again, that's at alexhausen.com, alexhausen.com. All right, that link and others will all be found at the show notes at nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash CE writing business. There's a hyphenated. All right, what else? Uh, well, I have a quick reminder uh, that uh, if you're Starting your career journey and want to learn how to pursue one of 10 popular non-clinical careers and go grab my 20-page guide at nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash free guide. That's one word. Uh, also remember that the podcast uh, is made possible by the support of the University of Tennessee Physician Executive MBA program. Really awesome executive MBA that you can learn more about at nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash physician MBA. And then let's see, some of the links that I refer you to and you'll find in the show notes are affiliate links. And that means I get a small payment from the seller if you purchase the affiliate item using my link. So watch for those, be aware. Not all of my links are affiliate links. Um, I'll remind you that the opinions expressed here are mine and my guests. And while the information provided on the podcast is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge, there is no guarantee that using the methods discussed will account or will lead to success in your career life or business. So always consult an attorney, accountant, or career strategist uh, before making any major decision about your career. So with that, I hope to see you here next Tuesday for another episode of Physician Non-Clinical Careers. Bye-bye.